church, just as we have our hearts poised towards the Lord, uh, we're just going to spend a moment um, praying together for our church family across the nation. So why don't you pray with me? Lord, just as many of the saints who've gone before us have prayed, Lord, we say this morning, come Holy Spirit. Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And God, we just acknowledge right now our need before you and our need of you. Lord, I pray for every single person, God, who's tuning into this service right now. Lord, would you visit them with your presence? Lord, right now in kitchens and living rooms, wherever people are listening to this, Lord, would you just come? Father, I ask that you would do what only you can do. God, that you would heal the sick, that you would restore broken relationships. Lord, that you would provide for your children. God, give us wisdom to discern your will. Lord, draw us into further intimacy with you, we pray. Lord, would it be in this nation as it is in heaven? We pray your kingdom come and your will be done. Here is in heaven, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, it's good to see you. Welcome to our online service. Uh, my name's Johnny. If you don't recognize where we are, we're actually in our building here in Newcastle in the Northeast, just one of our many locations here uh, at Hillsong Church in the UK. So awesome to have you with us. Really believe that this time is gonna be um, one where we can just come together wherever you are right now. We can come together corporately as the body of Christ to lean in to the Lord, to his presence, to worship together, and also just hear the word of God as well. So pray you're gonna be blessed this morning. Well, church, right now we're gonna come around um, just a, a part of who we are as a church. We're gonna come around the tithe and offering. And so I'm just gonna read a bit of scripture to you from the book of Numbers. So this is Numbers chapter seven. And basically just to pull you into some context, this is where, um, the Lord has asked each of the tribes of Israel to come and bring an offering to him. And so it kind of lists all of what the, the leaders of the tribes bring. And so from Numbers 7, um, we'll go from like verse 11. It says, For the Lord said to Moses, They shall offer their offering one leader each day for the dedication of the altar. And the one who offered his offering on the first day was Nashon, the son of Aminadab from the tribe of Judah. His offering was one silver platter, the weight of which was 130 shekels, and one silver bowl of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering. One gold pan of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bull, one ram, and one male lamb in its first year as a burnt offering. One kid of the goats as a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats and five male lambs in their first year. This was the offering of Nehishon, the son of Aminadab. Now, that's, that's quite a big offering. Um, and if you were to read on, what it would continue, it would go through each of the tribes and then it would basically say exactly the same thing. And it does this like 12 times and it just lists exactly all of the same things. And there's quite a lot there as, as we heard. And there's a couple of things about this that really strike me. Firstly, um, the power of corporate giving, when we all come together um, and we look amongst ourselves and we bring what we have to the table and we bring it to the Lord, he's able to just do so much with it. And it's just something so powerful about being a church community is that this is the idea. This is the idea of God that we would be the church, not doing life on our own, but that we would corporately come together. And when we do that and we bring our offerings together corporately, God's able to do so much. But then also there's the individual aspect as well. Like the writers of scripture could have probably just gone, do you know what, all of the tribes brought this, but actually it writes it out 12 times, which kind of tells me that God's really uh, interested in our individual offering. God's interested in the detail. So we do it corporately, but then God sees your individual giving as well. He knows your situation. He knows where you're at and he sees your heart and he really cares about that and honors that. So as we come together to give today, just remember we're doing exactly that. We're coming together as the body of Christ to bring our offerings and bring the tithe to the Lord. But also 
God sees where you're at individually as well and he really cares about the details and he cares about your heart and the heart with which you give. So if you'd like to give, uh, there should be some ways to give on the screen just below me. But let me just pray over the offering today. So Lord, we love you and God, we thank you that you give us the opportunity to bring you offerings. Lord, you don't need them. You don't need anything. You're complete in and of yourself, but you give us these ways to partner with you and to align our hearts with you. So God, I pray you would bless your people as they give this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, guys, well, we've come to that time of our service where we're going to gather around the word of God. So I encourage you, grab a notebook or an iPad or something, but most of all, a Bible and uh, lean in. I believe the Holy Spirit's going to speak to you and quicken this word to your heart. So let's hear from the Word of God. Hey, listen, uh, last week, uh, you know, Steve and Joyce obviously arrived and we got them to preach. I think he, it was great. He wasn't jet lagged. And what was interesting, he had no idea that uh, coming into this Heart for the House season, it is the offering's only four weeks away. Uh, we put a theme across, I guess, what we wanted to tie everything under. And this year we, we put this message, uh, this verse, 1 John 4 verse 19. So at first we were loved, now we love because He first loved us. And Steve, without knowing, pretty much took the whole notes of my message today and preached it all last week. And so as I sat there, I was partly going, great message, but also going, oh great, I have to now go back and rewrite another one. And uh, he did a better job than me, it's fine, I wasn't insecure at all. But I did notice that maybe God's trying to get a message to us. That in our season, in this season, and who we are as a people of God, our church, the focus and where we have our focus is so important that it doesn't need to be on myself, but actually on my God. And as I love Him, it's gonna cause me to love others. And so I guess this season, as we come into Heart for the House, you may have no idea what that is. Maybe you've been around, you're like, oh, let me know what Sunday that is so I don't have to turn up and feel awkward because I can't give this year. Listen, as a pastor, I need to do a couple of things. Practically, if you're not aware, once a year, we have like a, a special one-off offering above our regular tithes and offerings. Uh, our, our regular giving that you have each week, that's for the ongoing running of um, the, I guess, the church and all the activities that we do, the staff and, and, and facilities, all of those things. And then once a year, we can, kind of come together and we call it a heart for the house offering or a miracle offering. And we kind of go further. We go above that and say, well, out of what I have, not off your credit card, not of what you don't have, but out of what you have, uh, we all together say, well, this is our heart for the, the house of God. And so once a year, we, we kind of come together and we, we kind of put an offering together and it really enables us to move forward. We, out of that over the years, there's been money going into, I guess, the pot that helped us buy the Hippodrome last week and a shout out to North. There was a bunch of building damage and so some of you are here today. Um, we got to need more money for Heart for the House to fix the building that just happened this week. But... Um, and so here we are, we're coming to this season and, it, and it's important we can take big steps forward. We, we helped, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people during lockdown with Love Your Neighbour and handing out food. I mean, the, the reach that this uh, season enables us to have is quite incredible and significant. And so I guess with that in mind, if I'm honest, coming into my second time of doing Heart for the House here uh, since we moved, it was maybe a little with a little bit a little bit of hesitation, a little bit of, uh, I can't really think of the right word, but I guess mindful of the current climate we're in, mindful of the needs of our church, mindful of the needs of, of budget issues and, and, trying to, and trying to move forward there, trying to, having the, the issues of, hey, we wanna do more for young people and we wanna do more for our communities. We wanna do more to be positioned for opportunities. I mean, someone out of the blue this week calls and said, hey, we've got another building in, in central London. And I'm like, that's fantastic. Have you got it for free? Because that would be helpful. <laughs> and, and we've got, there's plenty of opportunity in front of us, church. There, there is, and there's plenty of need, not just for our communities and our locations, but the, the city that's around us, we definitely need uh, to be positioned for that. But then on the other hand, I'm so mindful of the, the I guess, the day and age that we're living in. The fact that every time you open your news app or you turn on the radio or you listen to the news, we're hearing that, hey, inflation is soaring. It's um, the cost of living crisis. There's all these things that don't just impact out there. They impact your lives. They impact this room. And so there's this tension that I have as leading going, I, I know the needs of our church and the needs of our city we need to be positioned for. But I, I'm aware that many in here, you're like, oh, I can't. 
I've got nothing left. I've been eating off rice for the last five days and, and that's all I've got. Like there, there, there's, there's these real seasons of, seasons of life. And, and for me, I guess I wanted to make sure you understood that this year, please understand that my heart is that if you can't, please don't. Like there's no compulsion. There's no have to. There's no like you got to. And so this, this year, we're going to also not just have the offering, but we're going to focus on ways and abilities, I guess, avenues that we can still have a heart for the house and, and shift and, and position a heart for house with maybe some serving through some of our social justice projects, some prayer moments and things that are intentionally around that. And so we're, we're going to make sure that it's not just one aspect, but there's a whole bunch of opportunities to be involved at this time of year. And so I guess as I'm sitting there listening last week and the end of Steve's message, and he's talking about one of the incredible family that we love in our church here and talking about Miriam's story and that they turned up here in 2006 and they, you know, 500 quid in their pocket and without the incredible generosity of people in the church, taking them out for lunch, getting them connected. You know, some of her quotes I asked Steve to send me so I got it right. Was I walked to this place, into this place and I felt like they were waiting for us. I was treated like a human being. I didn't think people expect, accept me, but they did. Um, the church saved my life and the life of my children. Our life was saved. What he did for me, he will do for others. And I sat there inspired, like hopefully many of you who are here, listening to that story. And I started thinking, that was in 2006. Lord, I pray that that's still the reality of this church today. I pray are we positioned out of what we do have to be that kind of church that out of all that we've been through and, and what's been going on, that we are still able to that when anyone walks in this place, that we are ready to meet need and love and embrace and be around them. And then after not long I'd been thinking that thought, I found this wonderful lady, she's been waiting, she was down here talking to a few people. She comes up, she's like, hey pastor, uh, I've been here for the last couple of weeks and I'm a businesswoman from uh, Indonesia and I just wanted to give you um, some cash for the church, but I wanted to go to some specific places. And so that's the moment I get really awkward because I'm like, in case you don't know this, I've got a policy, I won't take cash off any of you. Like that will go to some of our team. And so when this lady's saying, I've got cash, I'm now looking for any team member close by that can come, but are also trying to be you know, accepting and thankful and all this kind of awkward dynamics going on. And someone comes over, you know, this has happened from time to time. So I'm thinking, oh, she's gonna pull out a tenner. That's fantastic. And then she goes, no, I, I wanna give 2,000 pounds today. And it's gonna go here and here and here and here. And I'm like, starts, you know, counting it out. I'm like hoping that there's no Daily Mail trying to take a photo of people getting <laughs> past the time with cash. It wasn't happening. And so and I'm like, quick, here's this person, introduce them. And I'm trying to, you know, say thank you, but also be mindful that I don't want to, you know, it's for others, it's for our church, it's for our community. And I, I loved it because she turned up intentionally. Like she came ready. She came full of passion and excitement. She came out of what she had. She, she, she's in a, a season of abundance and she wanted to do it and she had a mind on others. And I, I, I just came away walking, I guess, uh, out, of, out of church last week. And I was like, that's the church I wanna be a part of. That whether there's need, we can meet it. Or whether there's abundance, we can meet it. But it actually is not on circumstances based on a heart. It's based on a church that in this Heart for House season, it's not a wonderful fundraising uh, drive to get millions of pounds for the, uh, for the church budget. That would be nice, but that's not the priority here. I mean, if someone was to come up and say, hey, listen, I'm gonna, so you don't have to ever talk about money again. I'm gonna give you millions of pounds for the church for the rest of the time. Although I'd really, really hate doing this, I'd say no thank you. Because that's not what this is about. It's about the people of God having a heart transformation that goes, I love my God, I love each other, and I wanna make sure that we move towards this Acts 2 reality, that there is no unmet, ne uh, no unmet need amongst us. We're a long way off that, but if we have the right heart for God, the right heart for each other, we'll have the right heart for His house that'll be contagious, authentic, wonderful, and generous, and then that's the kind of church I'd love to be a part of. And so that's our heart as we go into this Heart for the House season. You'll hear a whole bunch of uh, messages and see things on social media. But I wanted to be up front right from the first week. It's a few weeks away. And if you can plan, be planning. If you can maybe go without some coffees for a few weeks, put something aside. Let's do something that says, God, I wanna intentionally shift my heart to be able to contribute to see your house moving forward. But if you can't, turn up anyways. Bring your faith, bring your expectation because we love everyone to be a part of this season any way you can in Jesus' name. But... Here we go. In a few moments and minutes, I wanna to talk to you out of Ecclesiastes chapter three and a couple of other verses. But I wanna talk about seasons. I wanna talk about seasons. 
You know, um, recently I had just one of, those, one of those moments, one of those London days, you know, where uh, you're so glad that no one has figured out how to record your inner monologue just yet because you'd be quite embarrassed if everyone could hear what was going on in your mind. One of those days where, you know, it, it just, it wasn't good. It was, it was one of those moments where I lost a whole bunch of perspective. I got frustrated. I was anxious. I, w- I was uncertain. It start, pretty much the day started off with just all the right recipe for Tantrum Timmy to come out that morning. And, um, you know, I woke up after a night of not much sleep. I'd been stressed thinking about a whole bunch of things. I'd been unwell for a lot longer than I'd wanted to be from the latest superbug that seems to be going around. That got me. And so hadn't been sleeping well. I, kind of, I woke up. The kids were running, running late for school, so that was adding uh, pressure in the home and trying to get them. I'd run out of coffee, so there was no coffee to try to correct my mood at least a little bit, I know. The enemy was at, at, the, at the doorstep, that's for sure. Uh, I mean, there was, there, was all sorts, there was tension between Mick and me and Nicola at the morning. You know, I woke up and I wanted to pray for three hours together. She only wanted to pray for two, so we're having arguments. About, it was maybe about something else, but you know, anyways. We don't, do, it's not that, that's not us. But, you know, and, and so I leave, the, I leave the house. I'm already frustrated just because the day hasn't gone well. I'm not feeling great. Did I mention I'd run out of coffee? And so I listen, I'm on the way to the bus and to get the bus and I'm gonna catch a tube and I'm gonna catch a tube into the offices. And I happen to be walking and I'm walking and scrolling and I open up my inbox and it just has to be one of those absolute banger emails, but for the not great reasons, where someone has found every way to, get at me, hurt me, you know, frustrate me. And I'm like, oh, what a great start to this day. This just keeps getting better. And then my phone rings and I take a phone call and it's a serious incident that's happened and it needs my absolute immediate attention. And I mean, we're not even, we're not even to 9 a.m. yet. I mean, this is all just a wonderful start to the day. And so I get to the bus stop, it's not turning up. So I'm like, well, fine, I'll just walk to the tube and I'm walking the tube, it starts raining. I mean, my pet's heads were falling off. Like, it's just not a great start to my day. And so we get there and I'm catching the district line, which also was adding to the issues. And so I'm just on the tube. <laughs> and I'm in a dark place. And I'm making light of it, yes. But you know those days, you know those seasons, those moments where it just takes a couple of things going the wrong way and then suddenly everything's a problem. I mean, it's probably only three or four issues, but suddenly like, God, why did you bring me here? Are you, you know, all this oppression is happening to me. Like, I, what is going on? What, you know, is happening? Are you even on the throne anymore? I know, Tantrum Timmy was out in force. And this is all happening in the district line while I'm smiling at strangers, pretending to be nice. <laughs> and so I'm just, you know, starting to feel sorry for myself. And I, I get off at, you know, Earl's Court, switch to the Piccadilly line, and I'm going downstairs. And I don't, you know, I haven't, I'm not the biggest music buff person and so I don't have much on my downloadable music and so I had two choices I got on the Piccadilly line to listen to because I just was not in the mood to you know give space to anybody so I'm just you know trying to find safety in my little space and really the the options were like Hillsong United album from 2009 Um, and I'm not proud of what I'm about to say next but One Direction I'm not sure how it was on there (laughs) I'm not sure how but it was there um and whilst I would have really appreciated Harry and the boys to seeing that's what makes you beautiful at that moment of my day, um, I, I kind of switched on uh, the album uh, Tear Down the Walls from Hillsong United circa 2009. And I just start listening to it. And suddenly somewhere between track one and you know, maybe four or five, uh, that, that song, you may know it or you may not know it, it's called The Desert Song. And it's all about talking about seasons and talking about trials. And there's a couple of lyrics here and it says, I will bring praise, I'll bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare. God is my victory and He is here. All of my life, in every season, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. And all of my life, in every season, you are still God. Reason to sing. Oh yes, I have a reason to worship. Okay, we could look. We'll, 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 thank you. That was us together. 
And as I arrived, I got into Holborn, I got out of the tube and I was a different human. I mean, I'm smiling, I'm rejoicing. I'm starting to remind myself, oh, this is just a season. What is in front of me? It's just opposition. It's just distraction. It ain't gonna take us out. It ain't gonna disrupt the church. We're the army of God. We're moving forward. The best days ahead. The best is yet to come. God is still on the throne. He's our healer. He's our strength. He's our victory. He's our overcomer. And we can put our trust in Him. And so when I walked into work, I didn't walk up to that person who sent me that email and say, hey, bless you. I just walked in and said, hey, good to see you. Let's, let's get together, let's solve these things and God is gonna sort it out. Worship changes everything. Listen, our seasons come and it's real. And I was debating whether to tell you that story because I'm like, maybe five years ago because, you know, pastor's supposed to be perfect. But that was this week, people. That was, that was fresh off the press. <laughs> There's no invincibility cloak because you're a pastor, because you preach. And I thought, if I can get that breakthrough, if I can have that reposition, if I can find myself in such a dark mindset and a dark, dark heart space so easily, but oh, I remember the beautiful power of the Holy Spirit that can pull me out. How much more? Maybe with all the things that are coming at you, maybe the things that you're in. I wonder what season you're in. Maybe you are rested and refreshed after the summer break. Fantastic. Maybe you're on the rise at work and God's blessing is on your life. Fantastic. Maybe things are just all right. They're not bad, they're not terrible, but they're just somewhere in the middle. Or maybe there's struggle street for you. Maybe you feel like your life is all under assault. And while I've been humorous with mine, maybe there's nothing humorous about what you're facing at all. And you find yourself stuck in a season, concerned, worried, full of fear, because there's all these things that we could list off. So I wanna remind you, I wanna help today, remind us that, hey, there, there is a God who is at absolutely at in charge and in control in every season. He is still God. You have a reason to sing and you have a reason to worship. The title of this message is simply that, in every season, in every season. I once heard some teaching and there's plenty of books about it, about the natural seasons that we have that are also paralleled and have purpose in our spiritual lives. That autumn, that in our spiritual life, in our walk with God, there's, there's always gonna be the same. And autumn is a natural season of transition, but there's an autumn, a spiritual autumn in our lives that happens from time to time. It doesn't line up with the natural seasons, obviously, but there can be a transition in our lives. There's winter, and winter in, in, the, in the natural, it's a season of death, and it's also a season of endurance. It, it kills off the bad bugs and the bad germs that will stop plants from budding and moving forward. And sometimes we go through winter spiritually as well. And we're like, why God? He's like, just hang on. I'm just gonna get rid of some things that don't belong in your next season because I'm about to make you go higher and lo longer and, la and just bigger and stronger. Then there's spring, the season of new potential and fruitfulness. Oh man, we love spring. Summer, the season of harvest and abundance. Each season is necessary. See, living things, you and I, we can't live in one season all the time. Things have to change. Winter is coming. And even though I was like one of those people, I can't wait to wear jumpers and the cold weather, I regret my statements. <laughs> Heating has been on for two days and I'm ready to go back. I want my long summer nights back and having to be whinging about it's too dark, to, it's too light to sleep for the kids and I'll take that over what we're about to go. But listen, seasons are essential. They're necessary for growth and flourishing. Each season holds its gift from God for you and I. And if we flow with the seasons and we understand, we truly understand that in every season, He is still God. We have a reason to sing and we have a reason to worship. So Ecclesiastes chapter three, I've got here from verse one to 14, but for the sake of time, I'll jump through a, a bit of it. Contains some wonderful perspective on the seasons of life. It says in verse one, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. And you know, don't get offended, it's the Bible, but I'm thinking killing spiders is fine, cockroaches is good. Maybe bees if they come, anyways. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance, dance, dance. Not dance, dance. Except you say pasta, not pasta. Have you thought about that, English people? Anyways, you're confusing me. Let's move along. A time to dance. A time to love, a time for war and a time for peace. In verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has made everything beautiful in its time. 
He's also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I'll jump down to verse 14. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added and to it and nothing can be taken away. God does it so that people will fear Him. Not be afraid of Him, but this reverence, warm affection towards our God. Like, wow, God, you're awesome. And that's why, so at every season we realise, wow, you're still God, you're in control, you know what you're doing. You know, it's um, in talking with some friends and, and, and putting this together, one of the examples we talked about was that, you know, life can be like a loom. And some of you have no idea what a loom is. It's, you know, if you think about a big rug that you pick up and you buy, a loom is a huge machine that weaves the, the strings and the strands together. It's this wonderful machine that brings order and structure and beautiful and beauty and art to a whole bunch of strands and different colours coming together. And when it's, you know, kind of the loom artist or the, the, the artist is sitting there at the loom machine, you know, if you understand this, if you're looking from behind or under the loom, it, it looks like a mess. It's full of snarls and knots and loose ends and it, there's no kind of organisation to what you're seeing. But if you go stand behind the artist, you can start to see that all these beautiful colours and patterns of, of the work on the loom can be seen and starting to take shape. You see, for us, when life and seasons are spent from living life on behind the loom or under the loom, the big picture isn't always clear. Life doesn't make sense. Some seasons are really trying and difficult. God, what are you doing in my life with that? Can't you just take that out? Hey, what's happening over here? Why did I have to endure this? What's going on here? When we spend on the other side of the loom, under the loom, we, none of it makes sense. It just seems chaos, chaotic and mess. But when we get above the loom, when we see it from God's perspective, and that's what Ecclesiastes 3 helps, we start to get a glimpse of life, of what God's up to and how He's ordering things and structuring things. So how do you and I find this better picture, this better perspective? How do we move from under the loom to around to the other side of the loom? Well, let's find out. Let me give you three principles here from Ecclesiastes 3 and some other verses we'll get into. Let's find out together. Because I'd love you to be able to walk. Maybe, again, you're going to spend the next seasons on the mountaintop and it's going to be wonderful and you're never going to have a trouble. But after pastoring for a while now, I've noticed that life can be tough. And especially when media starts going on and, and, and there's all this facing us, then you need to know if the season suddenly changed or you are stuck in a season, how do I make sense of it? How do I find my bearings? How do I not turn into tantrum Timmy on a, on a tube every morning this week? Well, number one, number one, understand that He, God, He is working it out. He is working it out. He doesn't change. He appoints a season and He is working it out. Chapter three, verse one starts off that there is a time and a season for everything under heaven. Under heaven. God's got it. Who decides when the seasons happen? God does. When we understand that, you start to realise you can put your trust in Him. He's figuring it out. Verse 10 talks about that God gives different seasons of life to us, that they're for a purpose. It's not by accident. There are seasons that come and there's a purpose to those seasons. 14 talks about that no one can disrupt the plan of God. No one can dis disrupt the plan of God. Not you, not me, not the media, not the weather, not, not anyone. God is in charge. So when we look at life from our perspective, Everything looks like that mess. We can't see why or a purpose. I've got this first picture I wanna show up of someone sitting at the loom, but it's from behind. No bald spots yet, still good. <laughs> there's a different picture, show the other one. That's the one. And so there's some strings. I mean, they're, they're getting in order. They're, you know, they're, we understand it looks pretty neat, but you can't see what's going on. If you were to look, we don't have, I couldn't get, find a picture of it, but down under here, there's just chaos and mess. There's like spools of wool and threads and you cannot tell what's going. All you can see that there's activity without any purpose. That's from being under the loom. Now go back to the other one. But this one, this is where you start to see some form. There's still plenty to go, but you understand, oh, that's why there's some orange and green and the patterns are there. I mean, if you were to go to a friend's place this week and just pick up their rug, or maybe just turn it over. I mean, they're gonna be furious. Like, I didn't pay for the underside. You know, I didn't, I didn't, that's not why I bought the rug. It's for the pattern on top. And we, we can look at this and start to realise, oh, okay, that, that's, that's what God's, He's sitting. And that's where the perspective that God has. But yet so often we can spend on the other side worried about our mess. When we remember that God, we can bring that down. When we remember that God has placed all things where they are, we can trust that He's in control and that He's bringing everything together for His purpose. 
He is the master tapestry weaver. And He's actually weaving it all together for you. He's the one who sits at the seat of your loom, of your life, carefully and masterfully weaving all the colours and the shades together in just the right order at just the right time so that your life, my life, our lives would reflect something of incredible beauty. So Ephesians chapter 10 puts it like this, for we are God's workmanship or handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's got you covered. This master loom creator is sitting there. And as we put our faith, our hope, our trust, our obedience in Him, it's amazing how the most maybe uncertain of times, the most weird seasons, the most difficult, painful moments in our lives, God's not sitting there going, oh, how did that get there? He's going, oh, I'm gonna turn this into something incredible. I'm gonna work this out. And He's working it out in you. It's not just for the person next to you or the person you see on Instagram. It's for your life as well. Listen, He knows what He is doing. He's got the plan under control. So let me remind you that those who put their hope and their faith in His name, in Jesus Christ, will not be disappointed, will not be disgraced and will not be put to shame. Those who trust in our God, consider Joseph. Joseph, when his brothers threw him in the pit and sold him into slavery. Man, if that's me, I'm like, it's all over. I mean, that, that is not, it's just, it's gone. But you watch what God did. See, God had a plan. There's this, you know, not mice, not moment thread in his life. But later, Joseph said this about it. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, talking to his brothers who threw him into the pit. He said, you intended to harm me, but God took that strand and intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. If you're in right now, you're a season, you're looking at that strand, you're looking at that story, you're looking at what you're going, you go, God, how can you use this? How can you use this hurt, this pain, this confusion, this uncertainty, this opposition, maybe my failures? And God's not freaking out. The masterful loom weaver is just sitting going, oh, I'm gonna use that. They have no idea how beautiful that's gonna help. And he just weaves it through and weaves it in. And it's a wonderful thing. So you and I, in the middle of these moments, let us not lose perspective of who is at the seat, crafting and so ever in control, bringing everything together for His good and for His purposes. That you and I would remind, and maybe some of you gotta write down some of these Scriptures and remind yourself this week, like it says in Romans 8, 28, maybe things are getting out of control. Hey, remind myself, remind, remind your soul. Hey, all things work together for my good because I love God and I'm called to His purpose. Psalm 30, verse five, I know that weeping may stay for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. 8.37 in Romans, uh, in all things, I am more than a conqueror through Him who loves me. With God, all things are possible. I know that He who begun a good work in me shall bring it under completion. Our oh, people of God, that we wouldn't just see what's in front of us as, fine out, as final and finite and as, as just how it's gonna be and there's no other alternative that we would have every reason to be confident in who He is and have confidence to declare that He is working it out. And maybe I can't see it, maybe I can't feel it, but I can have confidence that my God is ahead of me and He's making a way and it's gonna be okay in Jesus' Name. Come on, if you, if you believe it today, let's give Him some praise. Second truth is we've got to believe and understand that he, what, he, what He is making, so He's sorting it out, he's, he's working it out. Number two, so what He is making, it will be beautiful. It'll be beautiful, wonderful, majestic. Let me look at verse 11 of chapter three together for a moment. It says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set a turn in the heart, human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. See, God has set a turn in, in our hearts. God loves us so much that He's given this, us this longing for home, this longing for something more beyond this world. And He won't let us be satisfied without Him, but yet no one can fathom it, says what God is doing or done from beginning to end. See, God is infinite, we are finite. God has a perfect perspective, but we have limited perspective. We can't always understand what God is doing from season to season, so therefore we have to trust Him. 
We have to trust God. I, I, I don't know what you're up to, but I know you're up to something and it is for my good. Because right at the start there, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Here's what you can bank on. Here's what you can depend on and here's what you can trust. That God's plan for His people, God's plan for your life, for your story, is to make everything beautiful when the time is right. It may not seem like He's on time, but He is always on time for His purposes. Someone once said, He is seldom early, but He's never late. I'm sure you've got story after story to your time, your life. When you had your date, time, hour set up that God, I need this breakthrough and I need it by here. And you claim every scripture, you fast, you do everything going, I'm confident God's gonna turn up. And this is what it is. And He doesn't turn up and you're like, God, is it real? This is not working. He doesn't answer my things. And then then later when God gives you the answer that you needed, you're like, oh God, thank you so much. You didn't answer my prayer. I mean, if I was dating the person I prayed for first, I mean, it would be a mess. That's your fictitious scenario, not my real life. But so often, like God, give me this, give me it. Now I I need it. And he's like, wait, 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 wait. I know what I'm doing. Get me out of this situation. I don't like this. This is uncomfortable. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I know what I'm doing. And as we trust it, no, we know that he doesn't, he, he will work it out. He's got it sorted, he's under control, but he will turn whatever situation we are in into being something beautiful. It won't be in, according to our timing, it'll be according to his. Life is kind of like a kaleidoscope. Let me give this example. You've been one of those kaleidoscopes where you look down and it's all blurry at the start or it shakes up and then you kind of twist it into focus. Um, I don't know if that's kind of not trying to be a pirate, it's just how it works. And, um, you know, that's how, it kind of comes into beauty, comes into focus. Depending on some of the artists, you trust me, if you Google it, it's fantastic. You can find all sorts of wonderful things. But it's just, it's just first like you only get it and it's, there's so much movement and chaos and different things going on, it's hard to grab it. But as you pull it into focus, there's this thing of beauty that turns up. And our life can often be the same. Where there's, you know, this whole bunch of chaos, this mess, there's different things going on. Because I don't know about for you, but life for me, it refuses to keep still. And so... You know, when it comes to our life, there's all this constant movement. And if we're not careful, especially for those of us who are control freaks, we like it to stay still. But God says, no, I'm going to move it around. And we keep kind of approaching God. Can you keep it still? I just want to stay in this moment. I just want to get my breath. I just want to get it under control. And God said, that's not the answer. The answer is to try and find the right filter, to try and find the right focus to make sense of it. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that's our focus. That's what starts to bring focus to it all and make sense of it and starts to arrange things so that what looked chaotic and messy and, and unfathomable and, and, and didn't make much sense through Him, that circumstance, that situation, that setback, that failure, you start to go, oh, through Him, man, this all starts to make sense. I read this, instead of changelessness, there is something better, a dynamic divine purpose with its beginning and end. Instead of a frozen perfection, There's the kaleidoscopic movement of innumerable processes, each with its own character and its period of blossoming and ripening. Beautiful beautiful in its time and contributing to the overall masterpiece, which is the work of one creator. That's kind of how our God works. When we observe our lives and maybe the world around us and we don't use this filter of faith, it's too easy to see chaos, too easy to see problems come up with more questions and concerns and answers and faith. But when we look at our situation, our season, our circumstances through eyes of faith, looking to Jesus first, asking the Holy Spirit to be involved, everything finds its place. See, Ephesians chapter two, I mentioned it before in verse 10. It says, for we are God's handiwork. Handiwork. In the Greek, this word, poema. Poema. It's this, this, this kind of translation of work of art. You are His work of art. Your life, everything about you. It's this point of this beautiful masterpiece. One version translation talks about this verse. You are His marvellous masterpiece. And here is God working it out as the master artist, working out the details of lives, bringing it all together so that we would understand and not have any, He's not creating a counterfeit. We, um, when we got married many, many years ago, we went to, uh, this uh, Thailand uh, for our honeymoon and it was amazing. And so I want Nicola was uh, up by the pool and I thought, I'm gonna go buy her a gift. You know, it's a honeymoon, it's fantastic. 
And so I was down on the beach and this person was walking past selling authentic uh, Thai made uh, wonderful souvenirs. And so this lady comes up, she goes, here, I've got a kimono. And I was very young at the time, and I didn't realize that kimonos weren't a part of Thailand tradition. It was more Japan, but that's not beside the point. And so I was like, that's fair. Nicola's going to love this. So I, I got sold up the river, and I bought it. I walk in, I'm like, babe, look at this. I bought you this. And she's like, what are you doing? I mean, I'm a student, and you're a youth pastor, and you're buying me a kimono that isn't authentic. It's from Thailand, and I'm never wearing that. Like, see if you can take it back. I'm like... No, I can't take it back. And so that began our first discussion of the marriage on honeymoon. <laughs> it was a fake, it was a ripoff, it was counterfeit. Here's the deal with our God, our, our Creator. He knows what He's up to. He's making it beautiful. And He's not making a mistake with your life, your story, and your season. He's got it under control. And maybe if you look at your life and look at your work, you're like, oh, yeah. There's no chance. Tim, if you sit down with me, have a coffee, you're going to find out that my life is not a masterpiece yet. Because I know who's pulling it together. I know who sits at the seat of your loom. I know who's orchestrating the things. And if he did it for Joseph, he can do it for you. It may take longer than you or I are wanting, maybe desiring, maybe even comfortable with, but he is working it out and he is making it beautiful. And maybe you're like, I can't see the work of art yet. That's because he's just not finished yet. If it's not a work of art yet in your life, He's not done with it. And as you keep surrendering to Him, as you keep putting Him in charge, as you keep submitting to Him, Jesus and, and His ways and the Holy Spirit at work in your life, you watch what He can do with even the most chaotic season and the chaotic mess in Jesus' name. Come on, worship team can come back up. And the third truth that I want you to understand, and then we're gonna put this into practice in just a few moments. Yes, He's working it out. Yes, He's making it beautiful. But understand this, that worship is our secret weapon. Worship is our secret weapon. In every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. And this is the beauty of our faith. It's the beauty of our faith. We aren't in a one-dimensional religion, church. We're not in some one-dimensional religion, one way, one transactional thing that has to prove ourselves or present ourselves in a perfect manner in hope of some new level of enlightenment. That's not, that's not our God. No, we have a relationship with Jesus. He calls us friends, sons, daughters, loved. It's why Jesus used that parable of the prodigal son and told the story of him embracing the prodigal, but kind of, Giving the, giving the judgmental, the righteous brother a little bit of an understanding. Because he knows our heart is too, too easy to become the righteous, self-righteous brother. And say, well, it has to work like this and do it this and you've got to have it all in sorted. No, Jesus is like, get over here, you mess. And watch what I can do with your life. You think that's wasted? You think that's gone? You think you've, you've thrown that all away? Oh, come back in and let's have a party. This is our God. This is our Saviour. This is how He sees your season, your mess and your chaos. He's not intimidated by it. He already knows the end. He's just waiting for you to worship. God is not after a perfected presentation to get His attention. He's after the authentic you. And that's why I can worship on the Piccadilly line without anyone knowing what's in my AirPods, trying to keep it cool. It's not like I got up and said, okay, carriage number 12, we're gonna worship Jesus together. (laughs) I mean, it probably passed in London, but you know, it wasn't what I did. I just sat there and I started to worship from my authentic place, as the Bible talks about in spirit and in truth. Sitting there, tapping my knees, along to the beat and reminding myself, God's in control. He makes everything beautiful in His time. So come on soul, worship His name. Remind yourself who He is. He's your strong tower. He's your protector. He's your defender. He's our provider. 
He's been building church for millennia and He ain't gonna stop now. He's strong, He's able, He's trustworthy, He's dependable. And I start to remind myself, this is who He is. I'm not trying to find out what He does. I'm trying to remind myself who He is. And I love going back to old worship songs because it reminds me of days gone by, of experiences, of encounters with God that even though I can't remember in that moment, even though I'm not feeling emotion in that moment, I begin to be reminded, oh, I remember how He turned up then. Oh, I remember the promises He's spoken to my heart. And if He did it then, let me be reminded of what He's done this whole journey. And if He did it then and He's been doing it since, then He's gonna do it again and He can continue to do it now. Friend, He is not gonna give up on you, your marriage, your health, whatever is concerned. He is working it out. He is making it beautiful. But worship is your weapon. And it's not about your tone of voice. It's not how loud you can sing. It's about choosing to realign our heart and realign our purpose and our will to say, Oh soul, we ain't giving up. We ain't walking away. We ain't being defeated. We're not gonna be intimidated. We're gonna remind ourselves that He is on our side. He conquered the grave and He can conquer what I'm facing now. This is who He is. In every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. We're gonna stand in a second and they're gonna sing that chorus together, that, that bridge. But before we do, I've asked the team to start the song with you guys, just sitting there. Let it bless you. Let you get into that moment of God, let me do some journey here. Not playing games and trying to do the right thing, but just with the Holy Spirit. Start to shift your heart. Start to focus again on who He is. And maybe there's a weapon there called worship you haven't used for a while. You've sung songs, you've sung melodies, you've read some, some words on a screen, but there's a difference when you and I put that authenticity to it, that intentionality to it, say, no God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sing this from a different place, not my vocal cords, but from my core and who I am. See this story, I'll, this song, I'll finish with this story. One of the, the albums, Jill, uh, McClory uh, sung it. And uh, I believe uh, Brooke, and, Brooke and, and, and Jill. And Jill and, and Matt, they're friends of mine. They're, they're actually currently pastors over in the States. And the week of recording, um, Jill was pregnant and she was you know, all excited and gonna have their baby and what comes with that season. And then the, their little boy, Max, he was 23 weeks and five days and was born early born prematurely, heartbeat breathing, but knew they were in the fight of their life. And sadly, Max died and went to, went to heaven, went to be with Jesus. And there they are heartbroken, waiting, waiting for their miracle. Got him and he, it's all, all over way too, way too quick. And so there's days of grief and all the rest of it. And Jill tells a story about how she remembers a few days past, oh no, there's this album recording coming up and I'm supposed to be doing it. And then she just feels in herself, no, I, I need to do it. Not because I have to or because there's expectation, because I, I'm made to do this. And though I'm hurting and though I'm grieving, I need the presence of God more than ever in my life and in this season. And so she's talking about how leading up to that night, leading up to that moment, you know, there's God, there's the presence of God, but it's not the way it was. Maybe the grief is too much. Maybe, maybe it's all, 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 all too much for her. But she's like, no, I'm not giving up. I'm gonna to continue to declare. I'm gonna to continue to do this. She tells this story that that night recording, that as she stands and starts to sing, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. A few days previously, saying goodbye to her little one, is there going, God, I don't know how you're working this out. I don't know how you're going to but I know I can trust You. I know that through the good, the bad and the, and the tragic, You are still are my God and I'm not gonna lose my reason to sing and I'm not gonna lose my reason to worship. And the presence of God hit her with such force. She says, that's the moment I knew it was all gonna be okay. God was always there. It was the worship, weapon of worship that started to turn things around. Let me read you this quote and then the team are gonna sing over us. 
from Spurgeon. God does not need your strength. He has more than enough power of His own. He asks for your weakness. He has none of that Himself. And He is longing to take your weakness and use it as the mighty instrument in His own mighty hand. Will you not yield your weakness to Him so that you may receive His strength? Why don't you just close your eyes right where you're at? God, I thank You that You see every single one of our seasons. See, those of us who have just got some immediate, maybe even temporal things going on right now. And you see those of us who have been facing struggles and battles for weeks, months, years, maybe even decades. So God, today, as individuals and as collective as Your church, we wanna remind ourselves once again, in every season, You are still God. That You do bring it all together and make it work. That You are gonna make this tragedy or hurt or confusion, God, we trust You to make it beautiful. So in the waiting, God, we choose to worship. Would you have your way in Jesus' name? In the quiet, in the stillness, I know that you are God. In the secret of your presence, I know there are.
Well, I hope that that word really spoke to you and that the Lord ministered to you through that word. And I'm guessing that you're here because there's something in your heart that has been reaching out for something. And I just want to say, we believe that that's Jesus. And we believe that your heart will not rest until it rests in Christ. And so if you're kind of thinking, I want to respond, I need to do something with what I've heard, then I would love to invite you to pray a prayer um, and make a, I guess what we call a confession of faith in Jesus. And you know, I, we believe that you were made in the image of God and that you were created to be in relationship with God. And the way that we have that is through Jesus. Because the world will tell us, try and tell us who we are and throw all sorts of different things at us. But like I said, our hearts won't rest until they rest in Jesus. And what he did on the cross, his resurrection, it's available to you. That new life is yours. And so if that's you and you kind of think, I, I, Johnny, I want to pray that prayer, then I'm going to pray a prayer right now. And why don't you pray it with me? And, um, and we'll do it together. So a little bit something like this. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me. Thank you that you gave your life for me. Thank you that you rose again to give me eternal life. Lord, from this day forward, I turn my back on sin and I turn towards you. Lord, from this day forward, I'm yours and you are mine. And from this day forward, I declare that I have decided to follow Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do you know what? We believe that that is the single greatest decision that you could ever make. And right at this moment, the slate is wiped clean. Your past is forgiven. No matter who you are, you are a new creation in Christ. And that's just awesome. But do you know what? That, that doesn't just end here. This is actually just the beginning for you. And so just a few kind of next steps, if you like, to help you um, on your journey walking with Jesus for the rest of your life. A um, couple of things. First thing I would say, go out and tell somebody about the decision that you've made, because as you do that, and you kind of hear yourself speaking it out, you'd be surprised at what that does in you. And the thing is, is that you never know what it might do in the person who you share your new faith with as well. So go out and tell someone. Another thing would be get plugged into a great church community. Um, you know, this has been an online service, but like I said, we have locations all around the country and we would love for you to come and pull a seat up at the table, get connected into community. And a fantastic way to do that is through just what we call groups, which is basically just midweek community, people getting around a table, uh, each other's houses or like, like cafes, stuff like that, and just coming around, sharing life together, looking at the word of God, eating together and just, just being the church family of God. And so I would encourage you to get connected into a group. And you know what? We would love to hear from you as well if you did pray that prayer. So please get in touch. Let us know your situation and uh, we would love to pray for you as well. So yeah, again, congratulations. That's absolutely awesome. Well guys, hope you've had an incredible morning and uh, I just yeah, pray that you have been blessed and that the Lord has really done something in your life today. And this, I believe this is the first day of the week in my calendar. Sunday is the first day because I like to springboard into my week from today. So I pray that uh, as you go from this place, that you would just really encounter God this week and believe that he's really gonna work through you. So let's pray as we do that. So Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done in us today. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in us and through us this week. Lord, would you use us to reach people, use us to share your gospel of new life with people and bless us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great week, church.